Thank you, sir. Good morning, everyone. Today, my topic for the lecture is the recovery from stroke. In addition to that, I'll be discussing about the current concepts and the future perspectives with regard to the recovery patterns. So uh, at the beginning of my presentation, I would like to discuss about uh, the stroke burden in worldwide. Uh, as we all know, it's the leading cause of acquired and permanent disability. Uh, the stroke prevalence and the incidence, it's strongly age related. In Sri Lanka, the preven uh, stroke prevalence is approximately uh, 10 out of 1000 population. So with the demographic changes, elderly population will increase. So the demand for the stroke services will also be increased accordingly. So therefore, the better acute stroke related and in addition to that, the better acute stroke treatment opportunities are also increasing at the same time so that the survival rate following the stroke is, of, is also improving. Because of that, the novel treatment strategies are important to meet their uh, uh, needs. <clears throat> this illustrates uh, 15 different neurological diseases, which give rise, gives rise to disability worldwide. This is taken from a Global Disease Burden Study Group. This dark blue column represents the stroke, prevalence of stroke. So y'all can see that as the time, uh, the age increases in the x-axis, the prevalence of the stroke will also increase. And stroke is becoming the leading cause for the disability. Uh, among others. Initial stroke management, there are advanced methods for the acute management of stroke, starting from the thrombolysis, which is widely available in almost all the provinces, and also the thrombectomy. But only a minority of patients will meet the criteria to obtain them. Even though they have received the proper treatment, majority will left with uh, neurological deficits. Because of that, Absolute number of stroke-related uh, deaths and the disability-adjusted life years are still rising because of the higher life expectancy as well as increasing population growth. So in next few years, the numbers will be further increasing so that the higher capacities in stroke care and the neuro rehabilitation will be required. So now I move on to the uh, actual topic of my presentation, stroke recovery. It's easy to understand it's with uh, stages of each uh, the stroke recovery. Uh, stages starting from hyperacute period to the chronic phase. Hyperacute phase, acute, early subacute, late subacute, and chronic phase. The, the rationale behind this differentiation is that the recovery related process uh, is time dependent. <clears throat> so, in each stage, the recovery pattern is different and the neurobiological processes are different and sometimes the rehabilitation pro processes are also different. This graph shows how does each individual uh, behaves in their own uh, stroke recovery profile. So uh, during the initial stages, there will be a significant improvement in the uh, motor function in the first few weeks. In about three months time, there will be a less significant recovery when it comes to the motor improvements, uh, but the uh, cognitive function and the language functions will be keep on improving. In about six months time, the spontaneous recovery is usually at its limit, but still the cognitive functions and the language functions will keep on imp uh, improving. So it brings the problem that uh, whether the recovery profiles in each patient whether it's vary between individuals, whether it's affect, uh, whether the patient factors are affecting for that, whether the stroke related factors, for example, the lesion or the anatomy of the lesion, underlying, this, uh, underlying etiology, whether the, that is affecting the uh, recovery profile. Other thing is the time, the uh, time of the first medical contact and the onset of the underlying disease or the time duration where the patient is on the rehabilitation process. So the will, accepted uh, uh, theory with regard to the stroke recovery is the proportional recovery rule. Here, uh, 
<clears throat> it assumes that uh, patients on their average improvement, around 70% of the average improvement from their lost function will reach within three to six months after the stroke. However, the neurobiological processes that cannot be substantially influenced by whether the patient is receiving high or low intensity therapies. Uh, in addition to that, there are non-fitters for this uh, proportional recovery rule, especially the patients with initially more severe deficits, they deviate from this rule. So if you look at the neurobiological processes uh, behind the stroke recovery, it's again, it's uh, easy to understand with the stages. During the initial stages, that means the hyperacute phase and the acute phase, so the first, probably the first few days and the first week, uh, the recovery process is mainly brought up by reversal of cerebral edema and perfusion to the ischemic penumbra and changes in the metabolic uh, derangements. Later on, in about one week after that, mainly the plasticity enhancing mechanisms, especially the dendritic growth, axonal sprouting, and alterations in the neurotransmitters and uh, synaptogenesis. So the functional recovery, it is strongly associated with the formation of new synapses. So uh, they say that the surviving neuron in the peri-infarct area, uh, there will be dendritic trees, enlargement in the dendritic trees and the axons will be sprouting around so that there will be new connections are forming, not only in the local areas, also in the distant areas. And these uh, axons in the neurons in the contralational brain, uh, they will also grow towards the denervated tissue in both ipsilational and contralational hemisphere. In addition to that, there will be changes in the brain stem and spinal cord also. This fact is important because I'll be discussing about this in detail in later. So doing this uh, with this rehabilitation, in other words, the scientific recovery method what we do is we augment this uh, neurobiological processes in order to achieve the <clears throat> maximum outcome to the patient in an effective manner. So keeping these theories behind, we'll move on to our ward patient. We have selected several, a uh, couple of patients. The first patient is a young patient who has had a left side middle cerebral artery territory infarction. At the initial stages, it was complicated with cerebral edema. So he has to undergo a decompressive craniotomy. And patient was referred to us a uh, third week uh, of the post-op period. And he has received inward rehabilitation care for about nine weeks in our ward. And on discharge, uh, his motor function was uh, hemiplegia wise, upper limb uh, muscle power is grade one and the lower limb power is four minus. So he was able to walk with the cord cane, uh, but the upper limb function wise, growth grip is quite okay, but the fine grip is poor. And he belongs to the category of manual ability classification system grade uh, stage five, where he does not able to, he was not able to handle objects and there is a severely limited ability to perform even simple activities. Therefore, we had to train him for his ADLs, mainly with his non-dominant hand. The second patient we had was a middle-aged male who had a right side deep ICH and he has undergone hematoma evacuation during the acute phase following a craniotomy. He was referred to us on the second week of his post-op period and he has received five weeks of rehabilitation. On discharge, his uh, motor impairment wise, upper limb power was grade two and lower limb is four plus. He was able to walk by himself independent, even climbing stairs up and down. His hand voluntary action is still poor, but he was uh, belonged to the uh, category of uh, manual ability classification system, stage four. That particular patient's upper limb stimulation still ongoing. So both these patients, we had the challenge at the end of the inward rehabilitation process. Uh, even though we received the lower limb function to some extent, the upper limb function was poor. So it raises the question whether there's any element of non-functioning limb here. So even after effective uh, rehabilitation, ad considerably adequate uh, treatment period, still one particular uh, uh, limb is not functioning well. So is there any predilection for the upper limb? That's so if, the, if there's any way of identifying it earlier, are there any preventive measures? If there are, 
how to normalize it early because upper limb function is very very important so when it comes to the predictors of long term outcome of the upper limb function it's mainly determined by the level of initial impairment mainly the anatomy of the damage uh, according to that homunculus model the motor cortex there's a huge area was represented by the upper limb mainly the hand function not only the motor cortex also the sensory cortex also there's a large area was given for the upper limb function so even though there's a small area that is getting impacted the outcome the functional outcome will be huge and the uh, upper limb function wise individual finger control individual muscle activity there are a lot of neuronal interconnections a uh, lot of coordination activities are going on so loss of strength in individual finger control and lack of selective muscle activation will be a problem during the recovery phase uh, other thing is the somatosensory impairment sometimes linked to the thalamic area or the parietal cortical lesions so all these things are predicting towards the upper limb function will be poor so with the rehabilitation what we do is we are interfering with the normal recovery patterns continuous recovery pattern so scientific recovery method that is the rehabilitation what we are doing is we augment the neuroplasticity so that is the effective reorganization after the stroke so there are classical training based intervention such as physiotherapy occupational therapy speech and language therapy in addition to that there are novel multimodal approaches starting from con uh, constraint induced movement therapy pro uh, proprioception neuromuscular facilitation and mirror therapy which are available in our country and in our uh, center also in addition to that robotic therapy virtual based therapy which are having promising results the newer one or the latest one is the non invasive brain stimulation techniques like transcranial magnetic stimulation or transcranial direct current stimulation techniques uh, which will be the future in the rehabilitation so for the stimulation purposes we have to localize the specific site for the localization point of view that the imaging has a place uh, the usual rehabilitation point of view we hardly order any images even though we uh, order something that is to look at the anatomical changes but here what we really want to do uh, look at is the functional activity of the brain so the investigation of choice is the functional mri in functional mri they are specifically looking at the metabolic uh, metabolic activity or the blood volume in another so um, in functional mri following stroke we are expecting to see some metabolic alterations in the ipsilation or the lesion hemisphere in addition to that they have shown that not only in the ipsilational hemisphere there are uh, activity changes in the contralesional hemisphere as well so whether there is any functional relevance for our rehabilitation purposes is the problem they said that the contralesion the activity changes in the contralesional hemisphere is brought up by the transcallosal disinhibition so this transcallosal disinhibition they could even disturb the coordinated coordinated neural processing during the recovery pattern let me explain it further um, focus more on the uh, picture shown in letter c the m1 the m1 here it is the motor cortex in the lesion hemisphere so it gets excitatory response from responses from the primary motor cortex and rest of the areas from the brain so it was shown in green color arrow at the same time they get uh, inhibitory impulses from the contralesional motor cortex it was shown in dotted red color arrow so important thing is these inhibitory responses were from contralesional hemisphere it leads to maladaptive outcomes in some individual so this theory was practiced in uh, non invasive brain stimulation to improve the functional outcome what they do is uh, they uh, arrange the excitatory enhancing uh, repetitive transcranial motor stimulation protocols to the ipsilational uh, motor cortex at the same time uh, tms evoked inactivation of the contralesional motor cortex so that the net outcome would be towards the excitatory effect 
by inhibiting the convolutional hemisphere. There's no consensus as such at the moment, still it's at the study level. However, if there's going to be any uh, suggestion that would be the uh, rep repetitive TMS protocols using intermittent theta burst stimulation protocols combining with our conventional motor training in patients recovering from stroke. But there are critical variables for this TMS because it depends on the extent of the lesion. They have shown that the subcortical lesions are responding well to the TMS, whereas the cortical lesions are not. Even the uh, functional MRI reports will be showing the same thing. And the other thing is the time from the stroke onset. It's well, we are well aware that the plasticity induction is in a uh, reorganized brain years after the stroke is a bit difficult. So the best timing to uh, arrange this intervention is to uh, uh, start it early after the stroke when the endogenous plasticity at its maximum. This is to show that uh, how does the contralational uh, inhibition of the contralational hemisphere uh, affects the functional MRI reports. The first one is it's the baseline really, where the both uh, hemispheres were having activity changes. Uh, the middle one is the control one where the uh, stimulation has given the inhibitory stimulation, I'm saying. It is given to the center part. Still the activation will be there in both sides. Uh, this is the uh, study group where the uh, con contralational hemisphere was directly activated with uh, one hertz uh, repetitive TMS protocol, so that there's hardly any activity in the contralational hemisphere. So application of uh, theta burst stimulation in the ipsilational hemisphere. So, uh, this graph shows the blue color column is the resting one. Uh, red color column is soon after the, uh, so, soon after the intervention. So this one is for the control and this is for the uh, TMS protocol done study group. Uh, the gray color one is uh, column is for the three months, three weeks after the, the follow up candidates. So you all can see there's a significant improvement compared to the control group. So what I want to highlight here is the pairing of theta burst stimulation with motor training early after stroke seems to prom promote some motor recovery by enhancing motor network connectivity. That is being uh, tested in phase three randomized control trial, that is the CIRIS trial. And it is being, uh, uh, it was started in 2016 and it is still ongoing. They're recruiting 150 individuals. Uh, probably that will give some promising results in future. So the future would be uh, identifying the predictors for this motor impairment. Uh, we are thinking that the functional MRI as a predictor, it is a best option. However, the functional, the problem with the functional MRI is it is very much susceptible to head motion. And uh, most of the stroke patients, they are having uh, underlying small vessel disease so that it is interfering with the blood flow. So the functional MRI reporting will be a problem here. Other thing is the high density EEG, uh, re-emergence of the low uh, frequency oscillations during the movement. Probably there is a place in the future, but not fear the studies are needed. So uh, suggestion wise, the combination of TMS with the high density EEG, probably a potential to serve as an uninvasive test to be performed at the bedside in severely affected patients, but need further studies. So this is one of the case report where the uh, patient has been benefited from uh, repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation. This is a 19 year old girl who had a dense hemiplegia following MCA infarction uh, and has been uh, improved following this uh, non-invasive uh, neurostimulation intervention. Another case report where the upper limb function was specifically they have concentrated and has been improved with this uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation. Another thing is the uh, transcranial direct current stimulation, kind of similar uh, uh, technique, but the uh, underlying, uh, underlying uh, science is behind, science behind is a bit different, but the transcranial direct current stimulation also they have tried, and there are some good 
uh, results for that as well. So this brings to the end of my presentation. So what I have uh, discussed during the last 20 to 30 minutes are um, the absolute number of patients with stroke induced deficits are likely to increase in future. So the novel treatment strategies are needed to reduce the stroke induced morbidity and to increase their quality of life. Functional neuroimaging, as well as the non-invasive brain stimulation techniques are uh, important and they are significantly affecting to the neuroplasticity mechanisms. Network effects distant to the lesion also contribute to the motor deficit uh, and the stroke recovery is time dependent as well as the region dependent. So the brain stimulation techniques could augment the neuroplasticity in addition to conventional methods of neuro rehabilitation. These are my references. So I would like to pass my sincere gratitude to my trainer, Dr. Duminda B. Singha, Dr. Duminda Munidasa, a consultant in RRH, and Dr. Kunendrika Kasturi Ratna, consultant in National Hospital, and Department of Physiotherapy and Occupational Therapy now unit, my colleagues and ward staff, and all my patients. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Gayatri. Uh, uh, about uh, the, the very new information on stroke rehabilitation. If there are any questions, like she would be happy to ask. Yes, actually in that, uh, she was asking whether uh, regarding the inclusion and exclusion criteria for that particular study group, which I have mentioned in the CIRIS trial, uh, since that is the first trial, I think because of that, uh, when they are selecting the patients, uh, there's a huge limit. The exclusion criteria were significantly uh, higher. Anyway, that uh, they have specifically concerned about the patients who are having, uh, who are not having any seizure disorders, even in prior to this event, as well as after the stroke also. And they have excluded uh, childbearing age group, females and pregnant females and young females. And I can't actually remember the age group anyway. And um, most of the uh, patients with uh, long-standing illnesses, uh, which are uh, not controlled properly, they have been excluded. It's basically the kind of healthy, uh, healthy individuals who have been affected with the stroke with considerably high uh, deficit. Uh, they have not specifically prognosticated. They have mentioned it as the uh, motor deficit, dense hemiplegia mainly. Uh, so specific uh, lesion wise they have not specified uh, but dense hemi 